quite a while. Matt, thank you for singing that, just being sensitive to the Lord in that. Um, children are invited to Children's Church. Brother Jeremiah is ready for you guys. So go ahead and line up back there patiently, kindly. All right, let's take our Bibles now into the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter number 11. Uh, we'll be looking at the life of John the Baptist this morning as the kids are headed back that way. Pray for Brother Jeremiah. He's been, you realize he's been doing this 21 years now. He's been doing it a while. 21 years ago. I was trying to think what I was doing 21 years ago. I think I was young. I think I was young back then. So anyways, um, but anyways, he's, he's still young. He's still a kid, right? Uh, just an older kid than me. He's like a big kid to me. So anyways, Matthew, Matthew chapter 11. Um, it's good to see uh, y'all here. Miss Billy, it's good seeing you here as well. And just, uh, I know last year was hard for a number of you being here. I know several of you were out with, with uh, coronavirus stuff, not being able to make it here. Uh, but thankful you're here. Uh, but it's a reminder to pray for those that still can't be here. Uh, Miss Joyce, for instance, we need to pray for her health. Health has not been good lately. She's been struggling with one thing after another. So pray for Miss Joyce. I know she would greatly appreciate that. Also, I'm glad to have my family here. So I'll give a quick shout out to them. They've traveled all the way from California. They flew in, uh, got here about 12:30 last night, 12:20, and so um, got to bed around two o'clock this morning. It was great. And so, uh, anyways, uh, but they're here. So make sure you welcome them. Let them know that you're glad they're here. Smile, shake their hands. They're from California. They're not used to handshakes, right? They've been, they've been like socially distanced and all that stuff out there, right? So, uh, anyways, they'll, they'll be glad that you're here. Uh, I was showing my, my nephew. This is the thing. We went to uh, Kroger yesterday, and um, and as we're checking out, I didn't. I, I don't use a lot of bags when I when I uh, go grocery shopping because I I hate throwing away a lot of bags. Not because like environmental stuff. I'm like I just this is one more thing. And so if it's just a few things, I'll just carry it out. And anyways, but I told him, this is, I, I thought I would never say, it's like, hey, the bags are free here. It's true. Because you, you, like a lot of places, you pay for your bags. Isn't that ridiculous? Anyways, it's not my message today, all right? I want you guys to know. You're still welcome from California. Glad you guys are here. Um, what, we'll pay for them one day. I, we pay for them at Aldi, right? So that's, that's, uh, that's fair. But they're good bags. They're, they're really good. And uh, I'm rabbit trailing. So this Matthew, Matthew chapter number 11. The, uh, the story today is, uh, or the message today is going to be from the book of Matthew, and uh, we'll be cross-referencing a little bit with the book of Luke as well, a little bit of the book of uh, John. Anyways, we're talking about John the Baptist. Now, we've just finished 1 Corinthians, uh, finished with chapter 16. There were some spots that we didn't finish, not because I didn't uh, like, intentionally miss them, but there was one, uh, for instance, on spiritual gifts. We didn't cover a few things on it. And so we're just not going to yet. We'll probably come back to it someday. But, um, but anyways, uh, we'll address that um, and anyway, a few other things with it. But we're here in the book of, uh, of Matthew right now. And part of it is that we have a pickup week. I'm going to be starting in the book of Luke. And uh, my, my goal is to go through the book of Luke. We'll be going synoptically with the other Gospels. And so what that means is just we're, we're cross-referencing the other Gospels and the storyline, trying to follow. But we'll be following Luke's storyline uh, it's a, a lost and found is the theme, the idea of God recovering those things that are lost. And um, anyways, it goes directly into the book of Acts, which Luke is a penman from Luke and Acts. And so one into the other. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but we start that next week. So that's going to be um, the next week. Um, Easter, by the way, is two weeks away. So don't forget about Easter. Invite people to Easter service. Just two weeks away. Choir is doing a good job practicing. Uh, I was listening to them a little bit Sunday night and in conversation, I'm still hearing them on the side. They're doing a good job, so I appreciate Justin and the work that they're doing. Uh, it's hard work. It's hard work to, to sing. I know sometimes it's just it's what you do, but they work to make sure. Well, I'm going to take it back. It's hard work to make it sound good. All right, that's, that's, where, that's where it's different. So I appreciate Justin and the work that he's doing, and, and Bethany, of course, playing. And then, uh, so make sure you're, for choir, you're here for choir practice tonight after the evening service. Um, there was another announcement somewhere. I think that's it for now. All right, so let's, let's go to the, the passage here. Um, so Matthew chapter 11, the, the passage here, the way it starts out, notice in verse number one, and it came to pass when Jesus has made an end of commanding his 12 disciples. So what's happened is that they have been going out and they've been doing a lot of work. In fact, back in chapter 10, he's telling them to go back in verse number, uh, verse number five, he tells the 12, go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any of the city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And what he's saying is that there's a job to do and go get them. Specifically, as we'll be seeing in the, in the book of Luke, is go find the lost. And that's important. And say, we're right here, and we're reaching the lost house of Israel. And that's an important theme because John the Baptist, by the way, 
John the Baptist is going to be reaching and he's preaching that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, is coming, the one that's going to redeem us, and he's going to make our nation as it ought to be, and our king is coming. And so anyways, with that, uh, he's saying, go reach him. Jesus tell him, go reach him. And they're doing all sorts of stuff. And honestly, ministry is going great. It sounds like things are going well. And Jesus Christ was healing everybody. And so things were going well in that end. But as this is going out, and they're, they're going out and reaching a lot of people, and crazy good things are happening. In that, um, he sends them out. And then verse number 2, John the Baptist hears about it. In verse 2, now when John had heard in the prison of the works of Christ. Now, John the Baptist is in prison. And by the way, we don't get the name Baptist from John the Baptist. So we're going to clear that up just from the get-go. All right, some people are like, oh, we're Baptist because John was Baptist. Uh, the idea is John, <clears throat> excuse me, John baptized people. Sorry, take my quick drink here. John baptized people before Jesus Christ's ministry had started here on this earth as far as his earthly ministry. Obviously, Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, pre-existent, self-existent, God himself, um, second part of the Godhead, he's always been around, but he had an earthly ministry here for three years in his, after being born and, and in his 30s, right? So anyways, uh, John the Baptist now is, uh, is in jail, and he hears about what's going on, and it sounds really good, but the question is, who is this John the Baptist? Because he's going to question some things about Jesus. Uh, an interesting guy. It really is an interesting guy. John the Baptist to me is, is uh, one of those guys I would really love to meet. Uh, would have been interesting to meet. I, I'd imagine nowadays he'd be kind of like one of those guys that just disappeared into the woods for years and he came out and he's been living there for 20 years and just fine, you know, th one of those guys. Except where he had a very specific ministry. He was a man in the wilderness. Now, this is a Bible guy who was kind of a hermit, except he was around people all the time. That's, so I guess he was not a hermit. But he lived in the wilderness. He didn't live in the luxuries of the city. He could have. His father was a priest, an important priest at that, that had very important jobs, Zechari uh, Zechariah, which is found in, uh, earlier on in the book, and so uh, in the book of Luke specifically. And anyways, with John the Baptist, he's a man preaching in the wilderness. Uh, Matthew chapter number 3 talks more about him. Um, he talks about his preaching. Uh, verse number 1 of chapter 3 says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And so where is he preaching? He preaches in the wilderness. Interesting thing about the wilderness, not a lot of people live in the wilderness. Some of y'all live in country. How many of you live or have lived out in the country? All right, so it's different living in the country, isn't it? Uh, you don't have as many neighbors. I mean, you have some neighbors, but, um, but anyways, it's, it's, you're not around a lot of people. That's why some of you like living there, or because you didn't have to be around a lot of people. And we're increasingly enjoying more stuff like that but but the truth is that that's there's not a lot of people but but anyways when he's out there he lives out there and he doesn't live like in this really nice house custom built by whatever homes out in judea he literally just lives off the land it describes him in regards to what he was like in other passages as far as wearing leather and not like the cool leather right he wasn't like a biker or wore like leather pants he, this would just literally like animal skins is what he's wearing. And, uh, and he ate locusts and wild honey. His food was crickets, big crickets, and locusts, all right? That's what he ate, which it's a good source of protein. So he was probably fairly lean, fairly lean, except he also ate honey. And this is what he ate. Now, I just imagine him getting up in the morning, and he kind of slept by a beehive. And he would go over there and get the st little bugs out of his hairy... Um, clothing that he's wearing, animal skins, and, and then he'd reach inside and grab a handful of honeycomb and eat on that while he's brushing the stuff out of his eyes, and later on goes over to where the, one of the fields and grabs big old locusts by the hand and chews on them while he's reading scriptures for his devotions. That's just the way I'm picturing him. He's probably got honey. Imagine, if he's living in the wilderness, it's unlikely he uh, subscribes to, like, Dollar Shave Club for Men, okay? He's not... He's not doing that kind of stuff. So he's got this big old beard, lots of hair, eating honey. Now, I don't care how, how good you are with a beard. You're getting stuff in your beard. And, uh, and he's not, like, spending a lot of time washing it out. He's not getting Dove's like, soap to get it out of his beard. And so it's got to be a nasty beard. I mean, that, that's just my opinion, okay? This is how I'm picturing it. So anyways, this is the man. He's a burly man. He eats stuff. When clothes go bad, I'd imagine he hunts down an animal and kills it with his bare hands and takes his kid. I don't know how he does it, but regardless, he has it. And he's just a burly man, eats locusts and wild honey. 
I think he's kind of a cool guy. So anyways, with this guy, he's out there in the middle of the wilderness, out near the, uh, he's in the Judean wilderness near the Jordan River. We know that because his ministry is going to be there. And anyways, while he's out there, he preaches. Now, specifically, he's out there because he has a job to do, and that's to preach the, the coming of the Messiah. That, that Jesus Christ is coming. Now, they didn't know a name as far as Old Testament, what his name fully would be. They knew it would be Christ, but Christ is really more his title. And while there was prophecy in regards to his name being Jesus, while they were looking forward to him, they weren't really sure who it was going to be. In fact, John the Baptist knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but it wasn't confirmed until after he was baptized that he absolutely knew for certain who, uh, who Jesus was. Christ, that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Now, I'll explain that just a little bit. But, um, but talking about what he did, look at, look at how he made his clothes in verse number, verse number 4 and, and chapter 3, verse 4 of the book of Matthew. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. This is what he ate. And, uh, and anyways, so that's what he wore. But in verse number 3, for, I'm sorry, I apologize, verse 2, chapter 3 again, and saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The idea of what he's doing is he's preaching specifically. So this burly wilderness guy is out there living in whatever way he lives. I'm, again, questionable as far as uh, how, how cleanly he was, how clean he was. But anyways, he was preaching. The reason he was out there was to preach specifically that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Now, what he's pointing out here is that all throughout the Old Testament, there has been prophecy after prophecy explaining that this kingdom would be coming. In fact, in the book of Daniel, which we spent a number of weeks there, months really, uh, looking at those on Wednesday nights, they're looking forward to what would be coming, prophesied and what's described as 70 weeks or 70 weeks of years. And that's a different conversation. You can look at those online. But uh, anyways, as they were looking forward to this, I, the anticipation was that the Messiah, the king, was going to come and he was going to restore Israel as a nation to be an independent, sovereign country that is in charge, basically takes over. And it's the kingdom as it was supposed to be, which has never been fully the way it was supposed to be. But finally, the offspring of David would sit on the throne and rule and reign and there will be a 1,000-year kingdom with everything going great. And, uh, and anyways... That's what they thought was going to happen. And so John, by faith, knew this was what was going to happen. And so he's preaching. Here it is. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here it is. It's coming right now. So what he's saying is be ready. Now, why do we do that? Well, if you, um, if you were here Wednesday night, and if you weren't here, just perhaps you know it. In the book of Zechariah, we spent some time talking a little bit about the fact that, that this is what God wanted for them. This kingdom had a certain expectation for what it was supposed to be like. And, and they had not been following through. This kingdom of Judah was, was not participating in the things they were supposed to, even when they did the sacrifices, even when they would say whatever you would want us to do, God will do it. It wouldn't last long. It was, it was very, very short-lived. In fact, uh, if you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, and you, don't, you don't have to turn there, but when they, uh, when they get to the mountain and they hear the voice of God and they're anticipating as far as what they're going to be as a nation, they say, whatever God says, we will do. That's a good hard attitude to have, right? Whatever God says, we will do. That's, that's a hard, hard attitude we should have, right? Amen. We should. We should have the hard attitude. But here's the problem. They said that, and then there was the great quaking and thunderings. The mountain catches on fire. There's storm clouds all around it. Everything's shaking. People are screaming in fear, and they're terrified because they're hearing the voice of God. That's the last time a nation hears the voice of God. After that, they said, would you send Moses? Why don't you go up there? We will die if we hear his voice. It's so scary. You go up there and talk to God personally. And so that was it. That's the last time you'll see in the scriptures where God addressed a nation. And so now you have represented Moses who goes up there as a prophet, talks to God, and God gives him the Ten Commandments, which had been given audibly to them, but now we're going to be written down. Whatever you say, God, by the time they fin by the time those commandments are finished being written in stone, they've already taken the gold that they had on their ears and necklaces and bracelets and whatever they had, and they already made a false idol and were worshiping it and, and, and were dancing around and just doing dumb stuff as they're saying, God will do whatever you want. We're like, well, it took forty days. Let's 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 forego that. Forty days is all it took. By that by that time it was enough for God to say, Moses, you need to head back down there. There's something wrong. 
And so anyways, uh, they weren't consistent, obviously, about that. And so by the time John's coming, he's saying, hey, it's time. We, we've, got, we've got to get some things right. We're not where we're supposed to be as a nation. It's time to we get these things in the order we're supposed to. In verse number 8, the Bible describes what he preached. Um, well, in verse 3, it says, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. In other words, Isaiah the prophet uh, spoke about this in several passages. Isaiah 40 uh, addresses that one would be preaching this. Uh, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. In verse number 8, it says, bring forth, uh, I'm sorry, verse 7, but when he, saw, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet to repentance, meet for repentance. And what he's addressing with them here is that there's a certain manner that's that's regarded that they're supposed to conduct themselves and they're thinking about serving the Lord and as far as a nation, and they're not fulfilling that. That's just not present there. And so anyways, what he's explaining to them, the Messiah is coming and, and we're supposed to be ready as a, as a people, and we're not ready as a people. And, uh, and so there's, there's more to that, but we'll, we'll address that at a later time. The, the point is that um, this is the anticipation. In fact, speaking of John the Baptist, the Bible talks about John the Baptist back in the Old Testament. The last reference in the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Bible written 400 years before Jesus Christ came, uh, references in Malachi chapter 4, John the Baptist. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet be before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite thee with a curse. Saying there's somebody that's going to prophesy about this one who would come. There's a lot of reference to John the Baptist in this. Of course, this is a... Uh, future reference as well, something that's going to happen as well. But anyways, in all of this, John the Baptist is preaching a great message. He's preaching this information. He's prophesying. He's speaking about Jesus who's already on the earth, but he's saying, here he comes. Let's get ready for him. He's coming. And ultimately, he's going to have some disappointments. Now, he didn't fit in as, as far as uh, the societal norm. He lives out in the wilderness he doesn't take care of himself as far as hygiene, what we would consider ourselves. He definitely is not the, the, the polished preacher of the day. During that time, you have synagogues. Uh, synagogues are kind of what we would think of as church though, as far as the way they function. In fact, you'd have, you'd have a specific leader of the synagogue, and then you would have a service where they would literally sing, and then they would read the scriptures, and then they would teach from the scriptures. It was very similar to what we would conduct ourselves in service. In fact, it's established probably back in the time of Ezra, the, the prophet way, way, way back a long time ago. And so anyways, this is something that's going on. And, but what's happening is the rulers and the leaders of these synagogues were these Pharisees that would dress very nicely. And sure, they, they looked the part and they knew a lot of Bible. In fact, it's typically regarded that they memorized the first five books of the Bible by the time they were 12. That's pretty good. I don't have five bigger books of the Bible memorized like that. They would memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's over 300 pages in my Bible memorized. I'd say that's pretty good. Say they knew they, they would fast every week, every week. We're like, oh, I hope we can do our national day of prayer one day and fast, you know, at least a meal. No, they would fast every single week, not like all week long. I mean, they did eat some food, um, but they would have certain meals they would fast through. They would give their money to the poor. They were faithful in giving to the synagogues and to the temple and the work of God. They, they were very good about it. But what he's pointing out here is that John the Baptist didn't fit into any of those things. Now, it's a wonderful point because it regards the fact that his effectiveness was not because of the way he looked, because of the way he sounded, because of his location. He had everything working against him. And so... We look at his ministry and find out that he was, in fact, a, an effective minister. In Luke chapter 7, verse 28, speaking about him, says, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Could you imagine if Jesus said that about you? Amongst whatever your trade is, there has not ever been a better fill-in-the-blank than you. That's a pretty cool thing to say. And Jesus said that about a prophet of God, John the Baptist, that he is the best prophet to have ever lived. Best person to have ever lived. That's pretty incredible. 
The Bible describes in verse number 29 of Luke chapter 7, And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. What they're saying here is they listened to him and they came to him. Even opposition would show up just to hear him. Royalty would show up, all sorts of people. He was effective even though he was in the wilderness. People traveled out there to hear him even though it was inconvenient, even though he wasn't giving them anything. He wasn't offering anything tangible for them to have except something in expectation of the future, a righteousness that was expected of them. His message was simple, is to get ready. The kingdom is here, is coming. And so he would preach against things that made him also unpopular in certain circles. One of the people that he preached against was actually the king um, or the, the, the governor of the land, a guy named Herod Antipas. Now, uh, there's a few Herods, if you'll find in the scriptures, um, go through, the, like even Paul addresses Herod. And, and so there's different Herods in the Bible. But anyways, this Herod was one that was just immoral, one that, that was not appropriate, obviously. He should be following the laws, the rules there of the Jews, and he's not doing so. So John the Baptist preaches against the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these spiritual leaders, and says, hey, you guys are just a bunch of vipers. But then against the guy in charge, like politically in charge, he calls him out. Now, a little bit about him. Herod had been, um, had been interested in a certain lady. He was really, really interested in her, so he pursued her. The problem was it was his brother's wife. And so, um, so there was actually two issues that take place there, one uh, like a divorce and then a remarriage. But then another issue is when he takes actually his brother's current wife and marries her as well. So there's unlawful marriages going on and some multiple marriages and and John the Baptist calls it out. Now, it makes sense to call it out because Herod considered himself the ruler of the Jews there. And the leadership of the Jews should be calling on the Messiah to come and to redeem them and make them what they ought to be. So he starts at the top down. The Bible describes him as preaching as such as taking an ax to a tree. And he didn't pull any punches. You ever have a friend that's just like brutally honest with you? That's John the Baptist. I mean, he just puts it out there, and he wasn't worried about picking fruit. He wasn't worried about cutting the branches. He went straight from the root and just cut that tree down to the bottom. And anyways, he wasn't very popular for that. Well, he was popular, just in the wrong way. Because of that, he gets put in, he put, gets, he gets put in prison. And anyways, during this time, you have a contrasting ministry that takes place, and that's with, with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is growing in his popularity. Back in Matthew chapter 10 and 11, where we started, we have a lot about Jesus Christ in which he's gaining popularity. People are, are, are following him by the thousands. By the time he gets up to, uh, to feed the thousands, there's several occasions, at least twice, one where he feeds 5,000 men, not including women and children, and he did so miraculously with five... Uh, five loaves and two fishes. That, that's pretty good. A little bit of bread and some fish. And I don't know what kind of fish. Maybe they're like brim or, or something. I like brim. But if, if that's what it was, maybe something bigger. The point is, I don't know what kind of lunch this kid had, but it wasn't enough for 5,000 men and women and children. It could have been seven, eight, nine thousand 9,000 people. It could have been a lot of people, maybe more than that. Some people say 15,000. I tend to think it's a little lower than that. But the point is, anything over 5,000 is miraculous. And then he does it again. He feeds 4,000 people. Remarkable miraculously and people are following filling country sites and then when they would go across the sea they all get on boats and go across the sea to follow him and they want to go everywhere that he's at and certain places he goes and preaches he'll be in a house eating with people and the house fills up with people that want to hear him and it's so heavy that people are stacked around at one occasion people drop uh, not they don't drop they lower a guy through the roof so jesus can heal him why because they knew jesus could heal him now, if they drop them through, there would be more healing required, but they knew Jesus could do it. And so they're doing this stuff. Jesus heals everybody. Here's what the Bible says about this healing, that this healing was for everybody that was brought to him. Now, you have faith, faith healers today, and they put a lot of skepticism into Christianity. It's one of the awful things. Honestly, if you're turning on your TV and you're going to, uh, to those religious um, channels, all right, be very careful. About, about these guys that are doing these mass healings or healings, like miraculous healings. I saw one, um, I, I wouldn't advocate this, this game uh, necessarily, but I haven't played it since I was like a, a kid, but it's something called Street Fighter. Now it's uh, literally, they put like the, like the fire, like these fighters, uh, like from this 1990s game thing with like when this, these televangelists will like move their coats and like strike people down and they put fire and they'd knock them down and use like karate sounds to like knock and like, Tons of people. And it's kind of humorous the way it's done, but here's the reality. People believe this stuff. 
And, and they're slaying people. I saw one where Benny Hinn had taken his jacket and he just swayed it over people and like thousands of people just like fell over. People were like, oh, it's the work of God. Listen, that's not scriptural. That's not Bible. And here's what the Bible would explain to us is that Jesus would heal everybody that came to him, everyone. And he would even go his, out of his way for that. In regards to the disciples, when they couldn't heal him, he didn't blame the, the, uh, the people that came to the disciples for healing. Today, if you go to a faith healer, and you can't get healed, they'll tell you it's your fault you didn't have enough faith. Who did Jesus say was their, whose, whose fault was it they couldn't heal? It was the disciples, the healers that couldn't heal because they didn't have enough faith in Christ to do that work. And so Jesus Christ was the only one that was able to do it, but he did it. That's the, that's the healing of the scriptures. Now, ultimately, there's a lot of deceivers out there. We're, say, we're told to stay far away from them. They present other gospels. In fact, in the, as we saw in, uh, in Sunday school, Romans chapter 16 describes it, that if anybody's preaching other gospels, to mark them and stay away. Stay away from them. Because it's a gospel apart from the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so with all of that, there's people that are out there, and Jesus is telling the truth, and he's actually healing, and he's preaching a message about his kingdom and that he's the only way. He preaches the fact that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes unto the Father but by him. He's the only one. And as he's preaching this truth, he is increasing. It's interesting to know something. John the Baptist says about Jesus' ministry that he says that, he must increase and I must decrease. John the Baptist was quite popular. People were going out into the wilderness to hear him. But then Jesus comes into the scene and all of a sudden things start getting worse for John the Baptist. Jesus is getting popular. Thousands of people are following him. In fact, three years later after this point, after the baptism of Jesus, Jesus would enter into Jerusalem on a Sunday that we would call Palm Sunday, something that would be celebrated next Sunday, uh, or at least we'd be uh, commemorating and anyways, they would, they would, in thousands, some people suggesting that could have been one and a half or two million people in Jerusalem. Now, you put one million people in Indianapolis, we're pretty spread out. Jerusalem's actually a fairly geographically small city. But you put a million people there, that's a lot of people. In fact, uh, during that, that week, what we would call like the Passion Week, when Jesus enters in, he doesn't actually stay in Jerusalem. He stays right outside of Jerusalem. Why? Because how do you fit a million people in that number of houses? It's just impossible. So you, you have all these people coming in. And it describes that he comes in sitting on this donkey with the coats of his followers that he basically uses as a saddle. And people are laying down palm trees and crying out Hosanna and, and excited about Jesus. In the meantime, John has really decreased as far as what his influence in ministry is. So John, one that we, we think would be a great guy, a cool guy in many regards as far as just completely willing to do whatever God wanted. His life isn't getting better here in the temporal, here in the in the. Um, in, the, in the, the present life in which we live in. He was decreasing while Jesus was increasing. Well, John would say something like that. The question is, to what extent is the decrease okay? Well, Jesus and John had a relationship. Here's an interesting thing about Jesus and John, is they were related. They were cousins, in fact. Uh, while Mary, we hear about the angel Gabriel that comes and scares her and tells her that you're going to have the Christ child uh, the same angel went and talked to a lady named Elizabeth, who the Bible calls old. All right? I don't think it's wise to call people old unless the Bible calls them old. All right? So the Bible calls her old. She's, in fact, stricken in years. So age has been there for her. And so anyways, uh, with her age, she's advanced in years. Her husband, Zechariah, is an old guy as well. They've desired children. And finally, this Gabriel, this angel says, you're going to have this child, and he's going to be John the Baptist. You're going to call him John. It actually tells Zechariah this. Zachariah this and um, in any ways miraculous birth not because he's born like Jesus he wasn't born like Jesus he's not God the son but he allows them to get pregnant being advanced in years and anyways at one point while she's pregnant uh, Mary comes into a room or I'm sorry Elizabeth comes into a room and the Bible describes that the baby John leapt in the womb now, I don't even know what that would look like. All right? I've never experienced that, but I've seen babies move around. Have you ever seen it where like a foot goes across the, uh, or the, the belly and you kind of see like the toes and everything? Or, it's kind of cool. Well, anyways, something happens where John leapt at knowing that Jesus was nearby, even though they're both in utero. All right? they're, they're both inside their mother's wombs, and, and John gets excited even back then. And so something very special. So anyways, they were related cousins on the mother's side, not on the father's side, because Jesus, of course, is God the Son. 
And anyways, uh, with all of that, what we find with, with, um, with John is that John goes out into the wilderness. He pretty much grows up there seemingly. We don't hear much about him. And in Matthew chapter number 3, it describes a little bit more of his story. When Jesus comes to get baptized, in verse number 13, it says, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized. This is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, or it's about to be. Uh, he's not done any miracles yet. This is the start of it. And uh, verse 14, John forbade him. So Jesus says to John, I want to get baptized. So he wants to come down. I get people to come to me and say, hey, pastor, I want to get baptized. Great, let's do it. And we're going to talk about it. Well, Jesus goes to John and says, I, I need to get baptized. Now, I, not, I'm not sure exactly how he did it. Maybe he stood in line. Maybe, maybe it was a line of people getting baptized. Like, all right, I'm next. And, and John the Baptist is like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus wants to get baptized. And this is what it says in verse 14. But John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee and comes down to me. You should be baptizing me. What are you thinking that I'll baptize you? And, and Jesus, in verse number 15, Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For the, in other words, allow it to be right now. For thus becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. In other words, he allowed him to get baptized. He allowed Jesus to get baptized. I think that would be really cool. I, to, to baptize Jesus. Uh, the very first guy I baptized, I remember, was probably eight tall. I don't know if I can reach the top of his head. And, and it's funny because, I mean, he's a big guy. And not, not just like, I mean, heavy. The guy was like, was like his hands were, were enormous. He was a huge guy. And uh, I baptized him. Normally, I'll put my hand on their shoulder. <laughs> this is my first baptism, okay? So I'm like, this is what you're supposed to do. So I've got my hand on his shoulder. Nobody can see me because I'm like tucked away back there. And uh, anyways, and he says, I'm going to help you. I said, no, I got this. I practiced this. I remember in college, we practiced it in the pool. And, um, and we would, in college, we'd hold him down. I was like, in the name of the Father. Um, oh, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll do something. But anyways, with, with Warren, I remember baptizing him. And uh, he said, I'll help you out. And he went, like, straight down. Just, like, disappeared. So instead of leaning back at all, he just went. It was, it was interesting. And so anyways, that was my very first baptism. And I haven't dropped anybody since then. Or actually, no, I didn't drop him either. Um, and I've never forgotten, we don't baptize people for three days and three nights, and so there's, there's no issues there. But, uh, but anyways, only one person can say they baptized Jesus. That was John. And so I don't know what words John would have said. We, it's different back then, obviously. But anyways, he would have said something, put him down, pulled him back up, and the Bible describes that he came straightway out of the water. That's why we do not do sprinkling, because you cannot come straight out of the water if there's just sprinkles, unless you're that amazing, where you can dive through with sprinkles, kind of like the little rings that you can, people try to jump through. You're not going to do that with water. And so anyway, the point is he was in the water, came back out of, back out of the water. Even the word describes that specific, that testifies to that. And so anyways, what you see with John, though, is he's humble and he recognizes that this is Jesus. Now, it was at this point, if you notice, in verse number 16, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Remember, he was in the water, came out. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so what do we have there? At the baptism of Jesus, Jesus gets baptized by John the Baptist, and he gets put under the water, so you have God the Son. The heavens open, and the Spirit of God descends like a dove. A voice is heard from God the Father that said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You see the full fullness of the Trinity there in action right there at, the, uh, at this story. It's an amazing passage of Scripture. But John, knowing who it was, that it was Jesus, this was the confirmation of it. In John chapter 1, a lot of people will say that John 1 is the baptism. It's actually not. It's only talking about the baptism. Um, he describes who it is uh, in verse number 29, the next day after Jesus had been in the wilderness, seeing seeth Jesus come into him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. All right, so that's a lot of background information to a very quick, quick message. All right, now here's, here's a message for this evening. Or this morning, excuse me. Maybe it's this evening as well. Depends on how long it goes. All right, so in Matthew chapter 11, here's what we have so far. We have John, who's a special guy. He is bold. He's willing to preach against 
the rulers. He's willing to preach against the spiritual leaders of the day. It doesn't matter what kind of background he had or where he lived or what he wore. He was just simply being faithful. He was willing to preach to masses. He was willing to forego earthly things just so he can preach the gospel. That's what he wanted. And yet in the passage that we read there, the Bible describes that he hears about what Jesus did and he sends two of the followers of himself, two, two people that follow Jesus, oh, I'm sorry, the two people that follow John, and he sends them and he asks the question. He asks the question while he's in prison in verse number three of chapter 11. Art thou he that should come or do we look for another? All right, he hears Jesus doing all this stuff. He's healing people and helping people. But then he asks a question of Jesus. Are you the one or do we look for another? Now, I've read several people on this that have said, well, he's not actually doubting anything. What he's really asking is just for clarity or maybe that there will be multiple messiahs. He's going to do like the spiritual part. Somebody's going to do the political part. But that's not what he's asking. You see, the, the life of John the Baptist has been such that he's been anticipating Jesus. He's coming the, the savior of the world, the one that's come to take the sins of all of mankind, here he is. And so what's the point? Are, are you really, you really him? Well, of course, John. John, you baptized him. Of course, when you baptized him, you saw the clouds open up. You saw the spirit descending. You heard the voice of God. Obviously, this is Jesus. But at this point in prison, now there's something that we would call doubt. We, we've often heard of somebody else, Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas because Thomas said, I won't believe unless I, I see his hands. And in fact, if I, if I don't feel it, it never happened. If I can't see and touch, then it's not real. Even Jesus confronts him and said, here, here it is. Here's my wound, my side, my hands. Dust your hand into my side. Feel it. He, calls, he points out something. Hey, this is real. But with John the Baptist, he's in prison. This one whom like, no, you'll never fall. He doubted? That doesn't seem to make sense. You know, there's people in the Bible that I struggle with reading because I'm thinking, that shouldn't be right. Paul seems to be getting in fights with people. Well, Paul's my hero. Surely he's not doing anything wrong. Everybody else must be wrong because he's Paul. God used him to write books of the Bible. Well, what about David, King David? I mean, the guy after man's own heart. I'm sorry, after God's own heart. King David, a man after God's own heart, falls with Bathsheba and then ha tries to hide it. And then that doesn't work. So she, he has her husband killed and then marries her, listen, this is a shame. And it doesn't seem right because David, David's a hero. And John, the person who baptized Jesus, didn't just hold him as a baby, but literally held him in demonstration of the ministry which he's about to pursue for us, puts Jesus under the water and brings him back up, experiences this, and now he's in jail and he doubts. Quick message here for you tonight, or this morning. I don't know why I keep saying tonight. We were up late. All right, my, my clock's off. The, the point on this is that all of us can doubt. All of us can doubt. What did he doubt? I, I believe there's, um, there's possibilities that he doubted maybe certain things. Perhaps it was that Jesus would not fulfill the role that he thought he would. John the Baptist expected something. Here it is. The kingdom of God is at hand. When he says at hand, how long is that hand going to be? Well, it's not going to be the kingdom he expected. Now, Jesus does describe that he came to establish a certain kingdom, a kingdom in their hearts, as far as the spiritual aspect of the salvation that would take place would be brought into him. That's why he came. Jesus came to die. Why, why did Jesus come? He came to die. What did Jesus do? He died. He died. Why? To pay for what we should. We've sinned. We deserve to pay for our sins in an eternal hellfire. Jesus died for the wages of sin is death. He paid the debt. He, the wages of sin is death. He paid it. But he didn't stay dead. He rose again three days later. With that resurrection, here's what we find about Jesus. That Jesus Christ completely paid. He completely justified. Jesus Christ covered it for us. And anybody, the Bible describes it very clearly, anybody who would receive him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We receive this redemption. This simple, re this gift of eternal life that he wants to give us. If you don't have it, you need to be saved. That's what the Bible says. So there's none under name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You have to be saved. Otherwise, you do not get eternal life. You won't because you have sin that still has to be paid for for eternity. That's the only price that could be paid. So anyways, with Jesus doing that, he holds him and he's still doubting him, even though Jesus is doing all sorts of stuff. And so my question to you is not so much that did he doubt, because I believe it's obvious he did. 
John's had one declaration. And now Jesus is not meeting that declaration. So I believe the question then is to what level did he doubt? Did he doubt that Jesus was even the right one to follow? It's possible. Perhaps it's just that Jesus isn't going to do all the things that he expected him to do. Also possible. But the point is that there's a disappointment of expectation in regards to what is going to take place. And all of that is, is smashing his dreams for Jesus Christ as far as what he would want him to be. The expectation was that Jesus the Messiah would come and take over and start the kingdom that had been promised the fulfillment of many, many years. And so Jesus fixes it. How does Jesus fix it? Well, the Bible describes that Jesus answered those disciples in verse 4, chapter 11. Go and show John again these things which you do hear and see. I tend to believe something about this. That when John the Baptist heard about what Jesus is doing, the disciples that have been going to visit John in jail, in prison, are listening to John. And they're like, okay, send, go ask Jesus if he's really the right one. And so when they go to see Jesus, he's in the middle of doing stuff. And they go and ask him. They find their way up to Jesus. Hey, John the Baptist has a question for you. And he says, check this out. And so watch for a little bit. And here's what he tells them. According to verse number four, he says, I want you to go and tell him the things that you see and hear. In other words, it's just not just stuff. He's saying, well, you can experience. So I tend to believe that these guys stuck around for a while and saw some of these miracles performed. Verse five, here's what these are. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. This is a passage from the book of Isaiah, which John the Baptist had referenced his ministry as being from the book of Isaiah. He's familiar with the book. He's very familiar with this. And so now he's saying, I'm that guy. I'm, you're the fulfillment of the one that's going to talk about me. He left that part out of the, 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 um, the description in regards to quoting that passage. I'm the fulfillment. And so John the Baptist is told that what you did baptizing me, I'm now fulfilling the rest of the part as far as doing the work of redemption. And he sends him back. Verse number six, and blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind. And what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet, yea? I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, and notice what it says, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Like, there's nobody better. Now, I listen to that, and I get a couple of things. One is this, that if you doubt in your Christianity, there's going to be times where there's a disappointment in your Christianity, you might say, well, it's not working. Pastor, I listen to what you say, and we hear your message, and you tell us to have faith and trust Christ through all these things. I'm trying to take a right stand. I'm trying to be a good godly testimony at work. I'm trying to reach my family for Christ. I'm trying to raise my children in the way I ought to. I'm trying to share the gospel door-to-door in, -door in my workplace, at home, and my neighbors. I'm trying, and God, it's not working. Is this really the way it's supposed to go? And we'll, we'll doubt, we'll have questions, we're not really sure. And so Jesus comes back, and he doesn't say, Hey, John, you idiot, I can't believe you thought this stuff. That's not what he does. Hey, John, come on now, here's all this proof. That's not what he does. He quotes to him a passage of scripture, and he settles it. And there's never again anything you'll hear about John the Baptist questioning. Now, shortly after that, we assume at some time not too far in the future, John the Baptist is still in prison, and uh, the king, who doesn't like John the Baptist very much, is at a party, and his current wife uh, has a daughter who's dancing in front of him and says, hey, I'll give you whatever you want to this girl. And she says, I want the head of John the Baptist. And so they cut off John the Baptist's head, and he dies. Truly the decrease of John the Baptist and the increase of Jesus is seen. The point on that is it didn't seem to go well except for something is known here. That in this, what God is doing, what Jesus is doing, he's supplying for us what we need to maintain a confidence in our Christianity. A couple things. One, when you doubt, ask questions. Ask questions. But don't just ask questions. Ever. Can I encourage you something? When you doubt, don't ask Google. All right? Google is the worst person you can ask. They're going to give you bad answers. And here's the thing. Google's going to give you any answer you want. Whatever that doubt is there, it'll be supplied. Just about anything you can think of in opposition to Christianity, it's in Google. It's there. And a whole bunch of people have believed it before. You can make stuff up. 
And I've done it before. I've made up like a religious idea. Let's see if it's in there. And I've Googled it. And sure enough, it's there. Points to something. You're not that special. Other people have been just as creative as you are when it comes to weird things. And anyway, the other part is that the devil will supply as many excuses as possible. There's all sorts of stuff out there. And so let me encourage you, don't go to Google, go to God. The reason for that is because there are things that you already know. What you'll find in your Christianity is this, the gospel which you believe, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, and that you're trusting in him and what he's done to save you completely. If you've accepted him as Savior, so many people have this year. If that's the case, that is your launch pad for the rest of your Christianity. Over and over again in the scriptures, we're going to go back to that central idea, your salvation in Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, you have people like Job that say, we look forward to seeing our Redeemer face to face. I'm looking forward to him. I, I, I know my Redeemer lives. I, and this is hundreds, thousands of years possibly before Jesus Christ was even born here in this earth. Because obviously he had been around that whole time, preexistent. And yet, nowadays, we'll have doubts, and what we'll do is, like, we give up. I had a friend of mine who, uh, who prayed for certain things to happen. He, had just, he wanted uh, custody of his daughter, wanted his, his, his ex-girlfriend who had his daughter. Wouldn't let him see her. Just wouldn't let him. And he's like, my life is miserable until I get to see my daughter. Now, listen, I, I understand the concept. Obviously, your, your daughter would be very important to you, and I hope that's the case. But, um, but anyways, he thought if he could see his daughter, and that's all he worked for, he'd see his daughter, then he'd be happy. And here's what happened. After about two years of working and praying and did everything he needed to, he got to see his daughter a lot, anytime he wanted to. Everything just worked. Yeah, but, you know, I'm just not in a place that I, I want to be able to raise her up. In. And so he worked and he worked and he worked. He got a nice house and just wasn't satisfied there. Oh, well, you know, I, I need some good godly Christian friends. And so the Lord provides miraculously some guys his age. And, all, and, and it's the scene like one thing after another just miraculously would show up. And all those things that would show up there taught him something. None of those satisfied. The reality is that Jesus Christ has to be our satisfaction. Let me encourage you, when you're doubting, go back to what you know. Ask him. He spoke specifically to Jesus. Now, via carriers, right, by disciples. But he spoke to Jesus. Let me encourage you to spend time in prayer and then ask Jesus and get to know Jesus better. Well, here's what he points out is that Jesus has a track record. All those things, he's healing, he's working, he's doing all these things. This is Jesus. This is the one. Let me invite you to remember something, that changed lives are evidence of Jesus' work. He changed your life. Listen, none of you as Christians are what you could have been as far as the trouble all that would have taken place had it not been for the salvation of Jesus Christ. God spared you. We don't come here because we're casting judgment on others. In fact, what we see is when we see the life of Christ, we see the judgment of ourselves through the scriptures. Some people think we go to church because we think we're better than others. No, we, know we go to church because we know we're not better than others, and we need it. I come to here not so I can see how bad John the Baptist was. Oh, what a shameful doubter. But I see the reflection on myself and see there are doubts when oftentimes I feel like I would never have them. I've heard preachers say, I've never doubted a day in my life. It's interesting, the person that held Jesus underwater for a moment did doubt. The one that, that God said, there's never been a human better than, he doubted. And we're like, oh, but I would never doubt. That's beneath me. Listen, it's not beneath us. And who knows to which level we'll doubt, but realize the fact that you need to go back to who Jesus is. Stress that importance. Get to know that truth as far as who Jesus is. Take confidence in him, in his track record, and what he has done, and what he will do. And then this last part is this, realize your role. One of the issues that causes doubt is very specifically this. Are you ready for it? It's circumstances. Whenever we have circumstances that don't go well, it'll cause us to doubt. Not always, but just let me give you a reminder. We gave you those notebooks today. Last year we gave you notebooks, and I remember asking the question in March, how many of you have had the best prayer lives you've ever had? And a bunch of people were like, yes, God has answered and done so many great and wonderful things, and then something happened. Anybody remember that? It, it probably, 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 you probably don't even remember it, but the coronavirus happened, right? So global pandemic occurs, <laughs> and so just a little event that, that took place. And anyways, when that happened, I noticed something. People started struggling. Why did we start struggling with that? Circumstances. God can do anything. We saw it list after list. Praise God, God did this and this and this and this. Pandemic hits. Oh, I don't know. Woe is me. The world's falling apart. It's ending is God somehow more prayer answering in January, February, March, and then pandemic, he's less? No, I just think we're less prayerful. And in those things, realize something that we need to realize our role. 
your salvation, you being a Christian, as far as being saved by Jesus Christ exclusively, not by any of your works, it's not so you can become the champion that's inside of you. I'm sick of seeing athletes that will constantly quote, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's why we're going to win the Super Bowl. Can I tell you, Jesus doesn't care that much about a Super Bowl. All right, that's not that important. But we feel like that's what that verse is for. That's not what it's about. Your role in the kingdom and God's plan is the glory of God. That's what he has for you. And if God would use something specific like a game, so be, I, we've, I've been in three-on-three three, uh, tournaments where hundreds of people have come and people have been saved. And praise God. You know, God, God cared about that. Why? Because something mattered towards his kingdom. And in those things, what we're here for is to, I can do all things that God wants me to do through him. And in that passage specifically is even to have a good attitude, uh, to be thankful, to be grateful. And so anyways, what God wants us to do is to not fail at something, to not fail at giving him glory. For Boy, we fail all the time. He wants you to understand something. He never fails. So he'll always be there to provide for you to do what you're supposed to. Circumstances are bad, but I'm just fulfilling my role. Jesus Christ is elevated. John gets beheaded. You might think, oh, that's terrible. But doesn't Jesus also suffer a cruel, cruel suffering on the cross at his extreme how is he elevated not just by people they eventually abandoned him his highest elevation came on a cross of suffering and so for us realize our role in jesus kingdom is to be faithful in whatever god has put you in your circumstances do not dictate the reality of what our christianity is like your christianity is not dependent on your circumstances you've got a friend we sang this song he's my friend over and over again we're reminded of that he is my friend. I know it's a tough time. He's with you. I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. This is the reality we live in. So right now, you don't have to quit. Jesus is good. Let's take a moment and we'll pray. A couple, a couple uh, questions for invitation is this. One is, are you saved? If you're here and you don't know for sure you're saved, you need to be saved. You have to. The Bible describes it very clearly. There's no way, no other way but him. Trust Christ to save you. You said he will. The other part is this. Where are your doubts at? I think sometimes we don't want people to think that we're doubters because then surely we must just be weak Christians. Jesus admonishes us to understand something about John. He's the best of any of you, of any of us at all. So surely if there's doubt, it's time for us to go ahead and come clean with that. We talk to God, get that address. So let's go ahead and bow our heads. We'll dedicate this to God and we'll have a short invitation. Lord, thank you for the time you've given. We ask your blessing now on the time. God, I thank you so much just for clarity and wisdom. And I'm asking, Father, you would direct. I know it's a a little longer than normal for this morning, but I'm asking you would bless in our decisions that we would have confidence to follow you regardless of the cost, regardless of how difficult it is, and that we wouldn't get discouraged when things don't seem to be going right. For any here that don't know your Savior today, they would be saved. In Jesus' name, amen.